Welcome to another Healthy Indoors Minute. I'm standing in the rain right now, and all of you are staying home because of coronavirus. So as we're all cloistered in our nice, safe homes, uh, and of course that's a little preview of what's to come, I wanted to let you know that we ran a test last month as part of this Healthy Indoors Minute series on both of these houses. This one that we live in, the Tiny Lab, highest performance tiny house on wheels in the world, 200 square feet, and this brand new, 3,000 square foot house that is still under construction. It is now dried in. You can see this beautiful roof at the top. So a couple things. One is we are probably less safe than we think inside our homes because the inside of our homes is a chemistry experiment. Home Chem taught us that. If you haven't seen that playlist, tune into that. Uh, one funny thing about this video is that the term healthy indoors minute is ridiculous because this is a 40 minute long video interview that I did with Alice Delia who is a PhD chemist at Prism Analytics. And frankly, I like the whole thing. So I'm putting the whole thing on here. So this is a 40 minute long minute. Uh, it'll, it'll fly by. <laughs> the other thing is that of course it's raining and it's raining in the video. And aside from the fact that this is more and more life giving, uh, kind of in the springtime, this is the perfect time for coronavirus. Everything is flourishing, life is flourishing. Viruses are life, they are part of the beautiful ecosystem that we have. And of course, we're just one piece of that. Uh, I will also say that the audio in this recording was a little bit more uh, extravagant than I thought that it would be. I did not pick up on the fact that there was some scratchiness in probably my uh, side of the audio, so I apologize about that. If you would like to help us increase the production value of these types of videos, please do consider joining our Patreon membership. We have 30 members over at our uh, member-supported site. That's patreon.com slash home diagnosis TV. You can help us to up the production values of all this stuff, aside from the television show, which is a huge production cost uh, in and of itself. So I hope that you enjoyed this interview. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the information, which is very interesting, and I had never kind of encountered something quite like this before. You can, of course, do all this kind of testing on your own home or on the homes of the people that you serve. So uh, here is a little bit of a light into what is going on inside of the homes that we live in and the homes that we are building. So I was really excited to see the actual data of what the air inside of a super airtight construction site was like. Um, and I was very surprised, first of all, by the formaldehyde levels. Can you talk a little bit about that, Alice? Yeah, um, any kind of recent or new construction or renovation is always going to have higher formaldehyde. It's going to generate higher formaldehyde. Um, there's a lot of different sources for that. The biggest one is actually the wood that is being used usually for the framing, subfloors, um, and of course in the finishing you know, cabinets and things like that. Uh, even um, non-engineered wood, so you know, MDF or, or, or plywood, you know that there's formaldehyde in those, right? Because there's been a lot of things on the news about that. But even regular just plank wood, just two by fours is gonna have formaldehyde as well. Formaldehyde's pretty, I, by pretty much any living thing. I kind of thought though it was gonna be way higher than it is. I mean, all basically the only surface that's facing the interior is OSB sheathing. Yeah. And then we've got exposed eye joists. I thought it would be off the charts and this actually I, looks pretty- It weird. too, yeah. I mean, these are actually, uh, pretty average values for an occupied house, the ones that, that you got. Um, so yeah, 38 and 42 parts per billion are pretty typical to see. Um, so that is not what I would normally have expected from a new a new build or a newly renovated space. Very interesting. Uh, and so so did you somehow see maybe it's been, I don't know, you did, I'm sorry. You said it's been a while since, or you've been working on the house for a while. <laughs> you may have been time to off my chops. Yes, we've been working. Yeah. <laughs> I'm building this house with my parents. So yes, it's taken us longer than normal. So I, I think that probably, I mean, we've achieved greater air tightness because of the time that we've taken, but also, yes, you're right. If it was going to off gas, it probably had lots and lots of time to do that. The sun was beating down on the inside of the sheathing uh, yeah. a fair amount too. Does that affect, like, does it speed the off gassing process? How does it all work? Yeah. Well, yeah, so typically the warmer something gets, the higher that rate of off-gassing will be. So as the sun hits it, then yes, you are going to have a you know, higher rate typically because now you're going to have that extra, um, uh, that extra heat. Um, it's also going to be drying it out a little bit too, so that'll also help to uh, be able to speed up that off-gassing now and then limit it later because the uh, formaldehyde actually is water-soluble, so if you have a high-humid environment, 
the, you can actually, the rawhide can actually stay in that humidity. And speaking of water, this is the first time that I'm in this house and it's raining and there are no drips. Uh, I actually have this laptop set up on all my buckets that I had <laughs> gathered around. <laughs> so I'm like, I see it's a little bit, and I apologize if people were watching this later, but uh, of course it rains when it wants to, but I don't have to care anymore. Do I create formaldehyde? Do people create it? You do. You are breathing out formaldehyde right now. Disgusting. But it's tiny, are tiny disgusting. little amount. <laughs> so, so don't think that you have to, you know, hold your breath or anything like that. Um, okay, but just to be clear, do you agree with a lot of the experts that I've talked to that formaldehyde is a, like, elevated levels of formaldehyde are a major health risk for people? I do, yes. Okay, okay. So even though, and, and, and so can you clarify one thing also before we get off the formaldehyde topic and move on to the, the second portion of our test, which was very interesting to me. Um, when I talk to somebody in the wood industry about formaldehyde and how I'm trying to make sure that we stay away from formaldehyde, the first thing that people at a lot of companies are quick to tell me is, well, there's formaldehyde in all wood, it all creates it. And that makes me very suspicious. So when we talk about added formaldehyde, there's like a couple different kinds, right? There's urea formaldehyde and phenol formaldehyde. Can you give us like a 101 on what we should actually be talking about when we talk to these people at the wood companies? Um, well, they are right. There is formaldehyde in everything. Um, but you want to look at, yeah, the amount that you're going to have and how, essentially how free it is. So, um, depending on what you might have on a surface, you may, it may retard the off-gassing. So you may have a higher amount of formaldehyde in the product, but you're going to get less of it into the air for that same time as another, as, as another product would have. So, um, the phenol and the urea, um, they're basically just different resins that they use uh, based on the expected use of the product. So if you're going to um, have it used in an exterior uh, application, then you're going to want something that's going to be able to be more rugged in the sense of um, withstanding water and, and the weather and changes in temperature and things like that. Whereas inside, you don't care quite so much about, about those kinds of things. So you just want the material. That you and do they both come out of the materials that they're bonded to at the same rates? Is one more dangerous than the other? Um, the phenol formaldehyde usually has less formaldehyde coming out of it than the urea formaldehyde. So it would be a lower emitting product. Um, cool. There okay. are, yeah, there are also products that are called no added formaldehyde. So they, it's whatever's natively there, but they haven't added any. Um, ultra low formaldehyde, I heard that too. I'm, I have not come across a really good definition for what that actually is. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I have also seen products that are made of wood that say no formaldehyde in this product. So it's, just, it's a lot of it has to do with the understanding of the manufacturer or packaging or distributing company as to what they know is actually in their product. And the people who, who label the products are not the chemists like you who work at those companies. They're the marketing executives, right? Normally not, yes. <laughs> right. So they, they might not that. have a full understanding of what they're talking about when they put yeah. that label on. Okay. Yeah. So, so those products, a lot of them are have, um, are required to have what's called a safety data sheet. So that will look um, put on there all of the um, components that are considered hazardous in some way. Um, but that's all they're required to put in there is the components that are considered hazardous. Um, so it doesn't actually tell you everything that's in there, but it is a neat place to go and look to see what it is. And this is more for um, you know, adhesives and paint and things like that than it is for, you know, a piece of OSB or something like that. Right. There's a lot of focus around worker safety, but not much around the occupant safety right. after somebody moves in. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the uh, VOC reports just for the construction mm -hmm. site for a minute. I took two different samples, one on the first floor and one on the second floor. Yep. Um, can you explain what we're looking at in these reports? Yeah, so um, what we've done with this report um, is several things. One is to highlight any areas that would be of concern. Um, this is not necessarily a safe or unsafe or, or anything like that. It's looking more at levels that are we typically find in the indoor environment and then things that are elevated beyond what we might typically find. Um, so any new construction is usually going to have a lot of things like paint and you know some adhesives and um, you know, different things that might be coming out of the flooring. It's fairly normal to see a much higher level with a, a new build or a new renovation. 
But, and this is something that I, I am still flummoxed by, what it says in page two of your report here on, I think, both the crawl space and the floor two report is that the total VOC value is greater than the scale of the graph that you guys use. And there is nothing in here, like the only adhesive is the subfloor adhesive. There's no caulk, there is no spray foam, there is no paint in here yet. And yet the VOCs, which by the way, for those of you who don't know, VOC stands for volatile organic compound. All it means is a chemical that is in the gas phase. It evaporated from being a liquid or a solid and, and it, now it's in a gas phase. Is that correct, Alex? Yep, that's correct. Okay, so they're not toxic. They just mean that you can smell them if you have the receptor for that molecule in your nose, which a lot of these things, you know, we do, but we also use this machine to kind of pick this apart. So, so just the lumber itself is creating, I mean, of course, new construction has a smell, but I had no idea that it was such a strong smell that the machine would freak out over the amount of it. It was that expected to you. I mean, with, with the state of where we're at with no paint, with no, adhesives or anything like that. Does that sound normal to you? Um, it, it's a very tightly closed house, which is my thing that this is, or that this is being Um I'm not actually that surprised because even if the um, emissions are pretty low, if you're using low emitting materials and no DLC um, products and things like that, you are still going to be emitting something. So what's going to happen with that is with nowhere to go, it's just gonna slowly build up. So you might only have this much to start with, but after three months of this much every hour, you're gonna have a much larger amount. So that's typically what we see in a, in a, in a very tight uh, enclosed space. Um, Interesting. Yeah, in, in this particular instance, actually it's, um, I think actually most of it is the wood uh, because the um, highest chemical compounds that are present in the sample are um, what are called terpenes. So this is a class of chemical compounds that um, is typically emitted from plants. So one of the largest concentrations you have in both these samples is, uh, one, one of these is called alpha pining. So, and that is, as the name might suggest, one of the primary emissions from pine trees. So that you're probably gonna have quite a bit of pine as, you know, right. with that. so that plus another number of other terpenes are are kind of the big hitters uh, in, in these data samples. Um, so, uh, yeah, as you say, if you haven't put any, you know, the, the interior finishings on, then, then basically it's primarily the wood. Okay, cool. And um, so one thing that I think is interesting is that we have a total VOCs on floor two of 7,400. Is that nanograms per liter of air? That's correct, yep. And then in the crawl space, it was only 5,300, which is a significant drop. So are, do VOCs float? Uh, is there, I mean, is it just diffusion that these molecules are acting under? And is it just that there's more lumber at the top of the house than there is in the crawl space? Um, well, they will, the gases will move around. They'll move around pretty freely. They'll move around more freely if you're circulating the air. If you've got a fan or a ventilation system that's actively moving the air around, then what you'll eventually end up with is essentially an, a, a typical value through it that's not going to be changing much throughout the entire house. Since your crawl space is separate from the main part of your house, then it only has what's within that crawl space to draw from. So as you said, there's a lot less of the, you know, the wood and all that. So then that would again be my thought is that there's just fewer right. emission sources in that crawl space area. So again, we'll go through things. Yeah. And, and by that, you mean through the materials themselves, through the, the subfloor? Yep, yep. Particles won't usually, but the gases will, because the particles are much, much bigger than the gases. Right. And this is one of the things that I, I was describing our super airtight house construction to these chemists that we work with on home chem. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, the house is going to be, the, the membrane that we're using is airtight, but it's vapor open. And they said, no, that's <laughs> not a thing. And if it's a gas, if it's oxygen versus H2O, they're just the same size. They're going to, so they're using chemistry to affect these things. So that that concept of I'm not building a super airtight house, but I'm building a substantially airtight house is a big one for me. Um, so the really valuable thing that you deliver with these kind of tests, and we're going to have more of this discussion as we proceed with this house and then in, in the future on this channel, is that really what 
we're paying for when we get a, an analysis like this, which is not as expensive as I would have assumed that it would be, is you. Because I send the sample back and then you look at this and your, your software and your expertise puts in where these compounds that you found inside the sample co likely come from. So it looks like we've got coatings, PVC cement, which I imagine also might be things like subfloor adhesive. Mm -hmm. Probably. Would fit into that. And that was a, a highly elevated, uh, like a severe, I think, is what it looks like on your, your table here. Yep. Gasoline? What else could that be? There's no gasoline in this house, is that, there? I, yeah, I was I was curious about that too. So I actually took another look at the data that we have. And so um, the other thing we do with these is rather than just give you a list of chemical compounds and let you figure out what to do with it, um, is we basically use formulas to infer or estimate the amount that we might get of a particular category. Um, based on some characteristic of that category that we can then measure with a, a few measurements without measuring everything. I mean, gasoline is a very complicated substance. You know, it's got actually hundreds of chemical compounds in it. So I'm not going to spend our time looking at all of those. Um, so we're looking at a, a small number of chemical compounds. And in this particular instance, um, uh, there's this term people will sometimes use called BTEX. So that stands for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. These are some of the most well-known components of gasoline. So we're looking at those ratios. But those xylenes um, and the toluene, toluene, for that matter, can also be used in things like adhesive. So I think in this case, it got skewed. I actually have a canister of xylene in this house yeah. right over there for, as a solvent that we're using to clean yeah. our tools. So interesting, okay. Yeah, so what we're doing here is we're making our, our best estimate, but without knowing all the, the peculiarities, we, we are sometimes off a little bit. But, and so if a normal person was doing this in a normal house where people lived, as you're probably assuming that they are, if we saw gasoline show up, then that might be a sign that the garage has air leakage pathways into the house, mm -hmm. which is a, that's a very interesting number to know. Um, yeah. Personal care products, very interesting. Like, is that just literally from me wearing sunscreen into this house while I'm going, coming um, and going? Well, that is probably, again, um, the uh, multiple uses that you might get. So one of the components of the, of the uh, we find in a lot of personal care product products is acetone. Um, nail polish remover is a really good example of that. Um, but it's also a common solvent that you might use to wash the brushes or as a thinner, um, all sorts of things like that. So in this case, it's just that acetone is fairly high and that's what spiked up the personal care products. Awesome, so again, my lacquer thinner that's sitting on that shelf yeah. right <laughs> over there. Yeah. Um, and odorants and fragrances, that's probably the terpenes coming out of the pine. Yep, that would be the terpenes. So that is, okay. uh, um, I mean, I don't know, does it, can you smell it? Is, can you smell the wood in there still or is it? I mean, I I know the smell of a pine forest when you walk mm -hmm. through a beautiful forest and you smell that pining, what I associate as pining, but if, and it doesn't smell anything like that in a construction site. I think many of the people who are watching this channel have been on construction sites and it does not smell like a pine forest, but it does have a smell. And so I'm. it's interesting to me that like that is the same category of chemical, even though it doesn't smell. I guess Charlie Weschler told us that uh, limonene has a left-handed and a right-handed version and that your nose can tell the difference between those two molecules. Yeah. So is that basically what we're dealing with? Is that it's the same molecule? It's just like a slight difference between a pine tree and a forest and the pine that's cut and put into a, a house? It's probably more a difference in the proportions. So a natural tree uh, that's growing is going to be giving off a certain set. So it's not just one compound. It's going to be you know, 20 or 30 um, or more, depending on what, you know, what, what species you're talking about. Uh, but once you've cut it and you know, put it into... Uh, house or um, it's going to then that profile is going to change because now we don't have the bark we don't have the leaves and or the needles those kinds of things uh, mm. and it also may have depending on where it was sitting after it was cut you know it could also be soaking up something from the surrounding environment too so that could be changing that odor profile as well cool. okay so can we move on to the TMVOC report because this was this is really special can you explain that well, this is tricky. <laughs> uh, so 
um, there are several parts of mold and depending on what you're looking for, you might be looking at or measuring the different parts. So um, those parts would be the mold uh, VOCs, the volatile organics. So which are basically part of the mold's digestive process as it eats, it emits these chemical compounds. And that's typically what you smell when you smell mold is, is these, because these are gonna be in that range where again, they're gonna be in the gas phase. So you have a, a higher amount that's gonna be present there. So to be technical about it, you're talking about mold farts. Yes, yes. To be blunt about it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and just like the gasoline, there are hundreds to thousands of compounds that the mold is putting off, depending on what species it is, what it's growing on, temperature, humidity, other molds or bacteria that may be competing against it. So what we're doing is we're looking for, again, a subset of, of, of chemical compounds that are fairly common to most molds. Um, but again, we do have a little bit of that crossover with some of that um, construction or renovation type, type materials. So we, unfortunately, we can't be quite specific enough as we would like to be in order to, 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 uh, um, to just cover just the mold and not the rest of it. Um, and a lot of the studies that I've seen, I find them somewhat useless in the fact that they'll do, okay, here's everything we found that came off of this mold at this stage of its life cycle and all this, but it doesn't ever compare it with what you're going to normally see in an indoor environment. So it, it, from the point of view of actually using it um, as, a, as an indicator or, or as part of an investigation, they're not typically very helpful because they don't include that, what, what might be coming off that indoor environment. Um, right, so the report here shows that we have a mold, a total mold VOC, the mold VO or the mold parts in my construction site are lower than normal. Um, and that, that did surprise me also because this place, as you mentioned, we've been taking a long time building it. And like I said, the roof, this is the first time that it's raining and it's not dripping in here. Mm -hmm. So we literally have had, I, I have a squeegee that's like a, it's a shovel, but it's a squeegee that we've been yeah. shoveling water out of the house with and you know pushing it out of the backyard for months and months. Mm -hmm. And even before we put the lumber in, I had a video showing that the both the Dimensional lumber and the engineered lumber were getting little spots because they sit out in the rain while, uh, you know, when they get delivered, right. if, you, if you cover them, if you don't cover them very well, you know, whatever, they can develop through the humidity and the rain and all that stuff, mold spots and mildew on the lumber that's not even installed in the house yet. So people are building houses with lumber that has already got the bio, you know, the bio culture is on yeah. it. Um, so it's like an ecosystem being installed in the house. But this shows that it's minimal. Um, does that mean that they're dormant? And that the, if I spiked the humidity in here, and I've had, by the way, a dehumidifier running on this house since last February. That's a very nice, it's the one wow. that's going to be installed finally. So that's Good. part of why it's been dry. But, um, but might this come back? Are they gone? Oh, no, uh, no not necessarily. No, not at all. Um, so, so yeah, a couple different points with that is... Um, uh, the, as I said, the VOCs are, you know, the mold part. So only when the mold is eating, are you going to get them? Well, if the mold isn't eating for some reason, if it got dry or it got too cold or too hot, or somehow the conditions weren't right, um, if it runs out of things to eat, which in this particular case, I doubt that's the case since you've got right. all nice organic surfaces there. Um, so it's either, yeah, it's either in some dormant stage. Um, the house was open enough that you had enough airflow going through that before the roof went on, that it was able to um, essentially circulate out the actual VOCs were circulating out, not necessarily the mold, the mold would still be there. If you have a lot of air changeover, then all of the you know the chemical compounds in the air are gonna be lower, which would include mm -hmm. those produced by the mold. Um, and as I said, there are a couple of the chemical compounds that we look for in the mold that are often found in, in new build or new renovation. So we actually do, when we take a look at the results, we do a, a, a rough correction for that. So if we see that those are high, that it looks like a new kind of new renovation or construction, then we will adjust some of those that we know have additional sources in building related products. So it's possible that there is some mold or some mold VOCs and our adjustment was a little, a little bit too far. I took another look at it and I don't think that's the case. I think even if we did adjust it a little bit too far, I think you would still have 
maybe just in that beginning of that moderate range might be the sure. highest it would go. But you certainly don't have, you know, like mold covered walls that are going to basically fall apart or anything like that. Right, right, yeah. Okay, well, I, anyway, it was just like something that I, I was expecting to see it a little higher than that. So I'm very proud that that's not the case. Yeah. Um, but I will say for people who are watching who are freaked out about coronavirus right now, and freaked out about microbes, that microbes are not all bad, number one. Number two, you have microbes around. Number three, uh, just because you have a coating that's antimicrobial, if you, you're like, I'm going to change all the doorknobs in my house to antimicrobial, blah, blah, blah. Once it gets a layer of dust on that antimicrobial surface, it's not antimicrobial again, right? right? Because that now it can just sit on the dust instead of sitting on the antimicrobial chemical. Is that right. true? Yeah. Alex? It is true. Um, okay. And microbial is not necessarily going to be effective against viruses and bacteria. You want to look at the label pretty carefully and make sure it's going to cover all three of those if there's a product that you're going to want to look at. Awesome. So we're not talking about coronavirus here. We're talking about a specific thing. Um, so, so now let's leave mold farts and mold bio and move over. Or, or we can come back to it, I guess, uh, and come back to the tiny lab, which is the third mm -hmm. Uh, piece of the puzzle here. Yep. I tested the VOCs and the total mold uh, VOCs over at the tiny lab, which is a house that is lived in. It is super airtight. It is ventilated 24 hours a day. In fact, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab helped us to design the ventilation system over there, which uh, replaces all the air inside the house about once an hour, 24 hours a day. And so can you explain what this report shows for like a typical residential setting? Yeah. Definitely. So uh, this would be much more in line with what I would expect to see in a normal um, lived in, not newly renovated or not, you know, not having a lot of new things in there. Um, that can include furniture and things like that, too. I have seen it spike really high with like a new couch or something like that. Um, but the so the total VOC number is 1700, which is pretty typical um, to see. Um, there isn't really a this is a good TVOC level that, that doesn't really exist. Uh, mm. Most green building type of um, uh, standards or guidelines usually shoots for about 500, um, but most houses are in probably the 1200 to 1800 range. That's pretty typical for a house that's lived in. Um, and especially so if it's not necessarily um, got this, you know, this really nice air changeover that we've got. Um, that's not typical for our home. Even one that's got physical ventilation, it's still typically a lot less than one change, one air changeover per hour. Right. Things are still going to build up, and you're still going to have the contents, and then you also have what do you do in there? You know, do you cook and you clean, and you you know you like to carve wood, and you know, or whatever it is that you do in that house is also going to add to those. Okay, so you weren't surprised by anything in that report. Nope. Um, again, the mold is slow. Um, in this case, it might be, uh, well, part of it probably is that air changeover. So mm -hmm. because you do have such an air changeover, that is going to dilute the VOCs down at least somewhat. Um, but again, so if you are also dehumidifying and things like that, then it's also going to have less of a, uh, a water uh, source. So Which we are. Yeah. So the great truth about mold is if you don't have a water problem or a water source, you will not have a mold problem. So if you address whatever the water problem is, you always want to do that first before you do any kind of a cleanup or remediation for the actual mold. Because if you don't, then you're just going to grow again. Interesting. And so is it true? I, I heard, I don't know if you have this on the tip of your tongue, but I heard that you could grow mold on any surface, just like there are uh, farms in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. that grow in sand. There's no nutrients there. But as long as you have water and you have sunlight, you can grow plants. And some of the biggest farms in the world are there. So can I just grow mold on any, I don't need food for it really, as long as I've got moisture and I've got warmth uh, and you a certain need, you gross do need you do, need food. You, know, you do need something that it can grow but on. That could include dust, right? Human skin it flakes. It could, because it does, dust is not just dirt. Um, <laughs> dust can get pretty complicated depending on where you are. So, um, so yes, and in, in especially in an occupied place, you are going to have, you know, skin cells and dust mites and, you know, other kinds of things that are going to be present there that it, can, that it can grow on. And you can also have fibers of things like carpet or, you know, so maybe you've got a, you know, a cotton something or other rug or something. Cotton being a plant-based material would make an excellent food source for mold. 
Um, it'll that this is also why you get that on the like the inside of a shower, get that little bit of mold on there because now you got that again, get a little bit of a coating, got enough organic material in there to act as a food source, and of course, yeah. the water. So you are you get that little bit of mildew that's that starts to grow there. Um, hopefully, no <laughs> no more than a little bit. If you got a lot, then you you you've got, you've got other problems. Sure. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, so it says on the total VOC level that it's uh, elevated. It's right in the middle. Is that on the bell curve normal based on your baselining of how you're comparing this situation to all other residential situations? Yeah. Yeah. I would call that. Yeah. What I would see in any house. So elevated just means there are disgusting human beings who live here. <laughs> all, all human beings being disgusting, by the way, not just us. No, no, no. Um, so the, <laughs> uh, the levels are determined actually from some work that was done a number of years ago uh, to set up um, these ranges. So the you know 500 is that one that green buildings will often use. Um, so the potential effects or projected effects are what we use to calculate or determine those upper levels. So the 500 to 1500 range is expected not to really bother somebody unless they're really sensitive. You know, 1500 to 3000 is going to be a bit higher of a potential effect. Um, I would like to point out, this part, by the way, because you said the, the sensitive thing, that this is, what, what you're seeing on this piece of paper is the highest performance tiny house on wheels in the world. It's the only one that's ventilated continuously, that's super airtight, that all that stuff was paid attention to. And yet, when we have people who say, I'm environmentally sensitive, and therefore I'm going to go build a tiny house as a shelter for myself, even my house that I tried to engineer to be perfect is elevated above the yellow line that, you know, above the orange line that we're worried about. So I think that that's, to me, that kind of says tiny houses are just not going to be a healthy place for environmental sensitive people. Would you, based on what I just said, does that sound like scientifically reasonable? Yeah, um, a lot of it depends as you know, you do know on what you made it out of, um, how long it's been there. I mean, maybe in 20 years, this will have gotten down to a much lower level just because things have aged. Um, I know in some places they don't use wood most part they might use concrete so that takes rid gets rid of a really big source so you could look at other types of architecture styles if you wanted to get a, a healthy tiny house i don't know if you can kind of call it that um a lot of it depends too on what somebody's sensitive to so it could be something really specific so maybe they were exposed to a high level of something so that one thing what they're, they're um more sensitive to it could be a general set of things um there are an awful lot of people who say they have high levels of chemical sensitivity that have things in their home that are not helping. Um, like uh, those little air fresheners that squirt when you walk by. So that's releasing chemicals into the air. So even though that particular one might not be a, a, a concern to that individual, it's still adding to that total number. Your body can only um, handle or, or convert a certain amount. So that's called the body burden. So if it gets to the point where they call it a toxic body burden, that means basically there's too much for your body to process. And so that's when you get those more, more significant or severe effects um, that are typically kind of called that multiple chemical sensitivity. Very interesting. Okay. And so in the elevated, even though it says that this house is elevated, I'm looking at the list of likely sources. And the only one that seems to be uh, called out is coatings, paints, and varnishes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just like, is there anything in the raw data that you're seeing? What we typically look for for coatings, well, there's, well, there's, there's two basic types, right? There's sort of what you might call the regular um, latex paint, and then there's a low or no VOC latex paint um, or paint. Um, so in the regular paint, what you're looking at is actually a bunch of hydrocarbons, which are, are all around us, there's thousands and thousands of them, typically not a, um, a big concern individually, but when you look at them in aggregate, then sometimes you do have a more of a concern. So if you have a regular paint coating, um, you could have uh, you know half or more of your, your TVOC could be made up from those hydrocarbons. Um, and those are in a particular range. So they're usually about, um, nine to 14 carbons in them with various things attached to them. So that's 
a range that we look for. Um, and then there are the lower no VOC uh, paints, which are very misleading in the sense that um, there are particular chemicals that are deemed VOC exempt. Have you heard that term before? No. So VOC, but it's not classified as a VOC, which gets very, very confusing because- Who those, did that? Who is responsible for this? Um, that, that's the EPA. Um, they, had a, they did have a good reason for <laughs> no it. No name, no name dropping, but it was the no name dropping. Okay, I'll but, talk to them about that. That's interesting. Yeah, but they, they did have a really good reason for it, but uh, it's been kind of twisted around a little bit in the marketing ploy, I think. Um, so the VOC exempt solvents, is typically what they're called, are things that do not have any photochemical activity. In other words, sunlight will not produce a chemical reaction. So they were designed actually to for out exterior use so that you can reduce the amount of ozone that you're creating at the ground level. So from that particular perspective, it makes all the sense in the world. That, that it, in that in that realm, that's a good thing. However, we don't usually worry about photochemical <laughs> uh, reactivity in the indoor environment because we're not looking at all that much sunlight. So this is where you can get the no VOC paint that has VOCs in it. Um, it's just a different set. So rather than that grouping of a bunch of hydrocarbons, they're on this list, which you can go and, and get. I can send it to you if you'd like. There's this VOC exempt solvent list uh, that you can get from the EPA. It's actually in the Code of Federal Register as well. So in our um, the big, massive book of laws and, and regulations. Um, so as long as they use something that's in that list, then you could call it no VOC or low VOC. So Typically, uh, no VOC is determined to be less than five grams of VOCs per liter of paint. So even then, it's not technically no, that's mm -hmm. more now. And uh, low VOC is gonna be less than 50 nanograms, um, or excuse me, 50 grams of VOCs per liter of paint. Uh, a normal latex paint is usually about 250. Just kind of give you a, a, a viewpoint on that. Um, and we were told through the home chem uh, chemistry conversations that VOC, that like VOC rich paints, the full, uh, the full cream stuff, yeah. off gases within three days. So that the only person who's really exposed to it is the paint applier who is who has personal protective equipment on because that's part of OSHA rules. So they're protecting themselves. But the SVOCs for in the non-VOC and the low VOC paint come off over like 30 years. Have you heard that research as well? So... Um... The smell that you get from a regular paint is going to probably last about that three days or so, especially if you're going to, you know, put some fans in and open the windows and things like that. Um, the actual off-gassing from the paint actually goes on for a number of years. Mm. So um, it's it's kind of like the, the wood, right? The paint has that stuff in it. It's going to go so that you get, you're at that really high level in those first few days, and then it quickly goes down to a much lower level. Um, but think about it too, you've got a massive surface area. Think about the wall area in a, you know, a 10 by 10 by 10 room, right? I mean, that's a lot of wall space. So the, the source essentially is really large, even if the actual emissions are fairly small from that source. Mm -hmm. So um, now having said that, yes, there are some components of paint that could potentially last for a much longer period of time. A lot of it depends on the particular paint formulation, what kind of additives they put in, um, what kind of color, like, so when you add the color, the dyes that make up a color, you are adding VOCs as well, typically. So what gets printed on the paint can is what is essentially the base paint, the plain white, normal type stuff that you almost always add color to or um, stain resistance or, or light protection or, you know, whatever it is that you're going to add to it. That's what you get before you do any of those things. So as soon as you add any of that, now you're looking at a larger number of grams of VOCs per liter of paint than what the actual label says. Wow. Okay. Well, there's a lot to think about. Um, thank you very much for your expertise and your time. Sure. And we will come back to Alice and to Prism Analytical when we have finished construction and activated the ventilation system. But before disgusting human beings move in, and by that I mean my daughters, um, they're sticky. They'll get older and they'll, they'll be less sticky later. But anyway, thank you very much for your time. And we will have you back on this channel. I look forward to our future conversations. Thanks a lot, Alice. Thank you too. Thank you.